you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me yeah. there's nothing to fear now for I Christian. My name is Paul, and we are so happy that you are here today. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, and I just hope, you know, as we sing these songs this morning, I just hope that there'll be a, just a reminder um, of the celebration that is today, but also that we have a God that loves us, a God that is for us, and a God that paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So let's celebrate that together. Praise, 
treasures that fade I never know And you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love
this upcoming Holy Week, God, I pray that we would stand in remembrance and in awe of what you've done for us, God, that you, you knew what was coming, and yet you still did it anyway. With confidence, you died for us, God, so that you could save us from our sin, and you resurrected so that we could be with you forever. that's not good, I don't know what is. So Lord, we thank you for who you are, for your goodness, and I pray all of this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as Paul said, good morning. Welcome to Owensboro Christian Church. We are so glad you're here. It's great to see all of you here on campus, and if you are joining us online or on TV, we are glad that you have carved out part of your weekend to be here with us. As Brooke said, it is Palm Sunday. It is that triumphal entry that we remember that Jesus in his last journey into Jerusalem there with his disciples. And then backstage, we're talking about just the range of emotion this week that that they must have felt and that even today we still feel and go through. And so uh, just a great kickoff to the Holy Week this week. I want to remind you of a couple of things that are, that are happening this coming weekend. And one of those is we have a Good Friday service. And it is at 6 p.m. on Friday night. It's an abbreviated service. It's about a 45-minute service where we'll come, we'll sing, we'll reflect on Scripture. 
um, and just remember the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And then we'll turn right around on Saturday to begin our Easter services here at Owensboro Christian Church. Saturday's at 5.30, same time as always, but if you're one of those that, that attend on Sunday, the times are gonna shift just a little bit forward. Uh, we have an 8, we have a 9.30, and then we have an 11 o'clock. And we will have children's ministry at all four of those services. So whether you come on Saturday or whether you come on Sunday, we will have children's ministries as well. Also, uh, just want to make mention real quick, we are blessed each week to have our deaf and hard of hearing ministry and our interpreters here. And I am, as someone who has a son who uh, is hearing impaired, I'm very grateful for what they bring each and every week. And I just want to let you know, if you have family, if you have friends, or if you're watching online right now, and, and maybe that's you, uh, that service will be at the 930 service on Easter weekend. So just a lot of times people say, you know, when are you going to offer that service? And that will be at 930. Well, it is going to be a great uh, rest of the service as we're going to continue in our series, God is Love. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn it. Whoa, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I forgot about my little card. I'm holding it in my hand. Uh, I don't want to miss this because then somebody will say something to me. These little cards, great reminders for Easter service. On your way out, grab a handful of these. Take them with you. If you go out to eat you know, and you're having a conversation with someone, you can invite them. The times are on there. Just a great thing. Probably wouldn't put them on people's windshields. You know, We don't want to get phone calls where people are like, man, your church. They just put them all over the cars uh, in our parking lot. But just a great opportunity to go out and invite someone. Well, God is love is our series. We are in 1 John. Tom was walking off stage and I said, "By some, when you said someone's gonna say something to you, you mean me, right? And he said, yes, that's uh, not uncommon for something that one of us forgets and we're coming off. Two weeks ago it was me at 1045 service. Most, most of you probably come to 915. But two weeks ago we had a uh, baptism at the end of 1045. And I went through the whole end of the service. Let's stand together, blessing, we'll pray. And when I finished, I had two people jumping down up at me up front and the word baptism flashing on the screen in the back, and someone yelling at me in the back that there were, the lights were on the baptistry, everybody was ready, but I just not had forgotten. So, um, yeah, I'll have our good moments like that. Welcome to Owensboro Christian Church. Uh, I'm so glad to see you today. Um, as Tom probably mentioned just a, a moment ago, I, I walked in this hour just a little bit late, but today, Sunday, is what we traditionally call Palm Sunday. And it marks the moment that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem to great fanfare. You know, people lined the streets and they were waving palm branches and they were shouting, the one who saves, he saves. Now it would become evident not long after that, they didn't have a great understanding, the crowds, of the full extent of salvation that Jesus had come to offer. Nor did they really grasp what he would have to endure to offer that salvation. And that's why just you know, five days later on Good Friday, when Jesus gave his life on the cross, that people were so, many people were so angry and confused and heartbroken. They didn't know what was, was coming next. And so that's why they were surprised and flabbergasted just a few days after that. The first Easter Sunday, Jesus had risen from the grave. They either saw the empty tomb or they had heard that he was alive and they were trying to make sense of how everything they had lost had now returned and so much more. And, and so we're really excited about, about sharing uh, this Holy Week with you and walking through the different events. And every time we gather, we're celebrating the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. But there's something, there is something special about Easter week. And so I do, I do hope that you're planning to worship with us next weekend. You'll bring someone along um, with you to do that. And if you have the ability, uh, just throw this out there, if you have the ability to come at the eight o'clock service and you would like to do so, um, that certainly could help us at the other hours that we expect to be um, pretty full. So you come whenever is convenient for you, works for you, but if you have the freedom and want to come at eight, that could be uh, a blessing to somebody else. 
Next weekend, we'll not just celebrate Easter. We are also going to wrap up our series in 1 John, which we've been in this New Testament letter since February, and we're going to finish it next week. I'm going to skip over 1 John 5, verses 1 through 12 today, because we're going to talk about that on Easter Sunday. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 15. 1 John 5, verses 13 through 15. And we're going to discuss prayer, because that's the focus of uh, these verses. And we're going to tie what John says at the end back to Palm Sunday. So if you would, let, let's stand together as we read 1 John 5, verses 13 through 15. Standing out of the respect for God's word. Standing to uh, hear and receive what he has for us. Uh, and like Tom and I sometimes miss stuff, we don't want to miss anything God has for us here. So open our heart and our mind. I I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. It's the word of the Lord, amen? You may have a, a seat In short, John says here that if we know God has our best eternal interest at heart, then we can trust that he has our best immediate interest at heart as well. And because of this, we trust he has our eternal interest and our immediate interest at heart. Because of this, John says we can have confidence. And he mentions sort of three different planes, three different ways that we can be confident. He says we can be confident to bring our request to God and we have something on our heart, something we need, we can ask God of that, we can bring that request to him, confidence number one. He says we can be confident when we do this that God hears us, that's number two. And then he adds that we can be confident God will respond in accordance with his will, and that that will ultimately turn out the best for us. Now, a few weeks ago, I had a a conversation on this topic with uh, a member of our church right after service, I believe this hour, and they were talking about how um, their family had been praying over a matter uh, that impacted them for some time, and she said um, she was trying to hold together all the different things that she believed about prayer. And she said, Scott, if I believe God is in control, meaning he's sovereign and he knows what's going to happen in the future, like if I believe that, and she affirmed that she did, and I affirm that I believe those things too. God's sovereign, he's in control, he knows what's coming. She says, well then, how do I hold that with the belief that prayer is powerful, and you know, it makes a difference, and like this is something that I should do? Like, how does my prayer change things if God knows what's coming, and he's in control, and he's sovereign? And she walked through all the different feelings that she had in relation to prayer and the particular matter that they had been praying for. And when she, was, when she was finished, I said, listen, people, people find different ways to try to work out uh, how to make sense of all the things that you just said. But I would encourage you that y- you are holding the appropriate tension the Bible presents when it comes to prayer. The Bible doesn't present with prayer a simplistic answer where it's like, hey, if you, you, you say exactly this thing or exactly this way, then God's going to respond exactly as you see fit, nor does it present that, hey, God, God knows all that's coming, so we shouldn't even engage him on the future or the present. We should just let it be and see what happens. Now, the Bible presents this tension between trusting in God's power and sovereignty and also engaging him with the request of our heart. And I think Tim Keller hits the nail on the head when he puts it this way. He says, if we believe that God was in charge and our actions meant nothing, and in the context of what he's writing, he, he's talking primarily about prayer. Our prayers meant nothing. It would lead to discouraged passivity. If, on the other hand, we really believed that our actions, our prayers, changed God's plan, it would lead to paralyzing fear. If both are true, however, we have the greatest incentive for diligent effort. We, ha- we have the greatest reason to engage God at a at a heart level, a biblical level, level, um, a thought level with all the different requests, all the different needs going on in the world to engage him about those matters in prayer. We want to feel confident enough that we can come to God with all of those requests. Right? We, we'd call that petition, like we're asking God for certain things. But we also want to be respectful enough that our requests don't turn into demands. And you could call that submission. 
So we, we petition God with the request, but we also submit to him, recognizing, hey, God's God, we're not, and we can be confident that if we, um, he responds in accordance with his will, that's ultimately gonna turn out to be the best for us. And I would propose to you that biblical prayer lives within the tension of these two poles, the boldness to ask God for what we need and the humility to receive the answers he gives. And there are, there are several different biblical examples that we could point to that kind of model uh, what I'm talking about, but I want to give you just a couple. The first comes in the book of Genesis, way back at the very beginning, chapter 18, and it involves a man named Abraham. And some of you will know this story. For some of you, it'll be new, but I'll um, walk through the high points with you. Abraham is in the fields when he's visited by three strangers. And we learn later in the story that these, um, these strangers either are representatives of God or in some way, they are actually a manifestation of God. Some have suggested, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't know exactly what's going on in the moment, but they, on a, in a very real way, um, represent God to Abraham. And they say, Abraham, we've heard about this wicked city down the street named Sodom. And they tell Abraham, we've come to destroy the city. Now, that troubles Abraham at a very deep level because Abraham has a nephew named Lot, living in the city. He's got nieces and nephews. He's got nieces who are there. And um, so he does something quite bold. And he engages in this conversation, really this prayer with God. Verse 22 is where I'll pick up the story. Genesis 18, 22. So the men turned from there. Those are the three strangers. And they went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and he said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And so he's speaking to God here, he's appealing to God's character. God, you are just, you are good, and so in your justice, would you show, uh, would you mark a difference between those who are living righteous and those who are wicked? Don't destroy the whole lot, no pun intended, for, um, for the sake of the wicked here. And this is what the Lord said in response, verse 26. If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Verse 27, Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And God said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he, Abraham, spoke to him and said, Suppose 40 are found there. And he answered, For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then Abraham said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. I think at this point, if I was, if he was talking to me, I'd probably be getting angry at this point with, uh, like, just ask me for what you're wanting instead of kind of circling back around and around. But he says, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And God answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So I want you to notice here is Abraham feel, feels bold enough to bring his request before God, imploring him to act in accordance with his character. God, you're just, you're good. This is how you revealed yourself to us. Um, act in accordance with who you said you are. But then he also submits himself to what God's answers will be. Like he says, listen, I, I'm but dust and ashes. God, I, I'm making this request to you. Please do not be angry. I think I'm asking you something that actually fits who you are but I also recognize you're God and, and I'm not. There's petition and there's submission. And in this case, God listens to Abraham's um, prayer and he grants it, at least initially, in Abraham's favor. He says, if I find 10 righteous people there, I will not wipe out the city. Now, another classic example comes from the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it involves a man named Paul. 
Paul is an early church planner. He's a missionary. Um, early on in Paul's life or his career, he had actually worked um, harshly against the church. He had tried to um, snuff out the work of Jesus, and he was arresting Christians, and he was taking them to prison and putting them before uh, councils. And he's talking in 2 Corinthians 12 about all of God's grace shown to him over all the bad things that he had done. He's talking about these miraculous truths that God had shown him. And then he comments, in light of this grace and in light of this truth he's seen, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, we're not told what the thorn is. People have their ideas, but we're not, we're not clear exactly what it means. But he describes the thorn in his flesh as a messenger of Satan sent to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul reflects upon this and says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, just like Abraham, Paul feels bold enough to bring his request before God. He says, three times I ask God, would you, would you take this away from me? You know, would you change my circumstances? Would you free me from whatever this burden or this thing that I feel? God, take it away. And God listens to Paul's prayer, and in this case, he says, no. No, my grace is sufficient for you. And so Abraham and Paul, they each, they each bring their request before God. They each demonstrate this tension of asking God for things and then also um, being humble enough to receive his answer one sees their prayer granted the way that they had hoped, um, again, at least initially, because God doesn't actually find 10 people. He ends up wiping out Sodom. The other does not see his prayer granted as he had hoped. It's not that one prayed rightly and one prayed wrongly. It's that they received different answers. And this is um, sort of what John is getting at when he tells us in 1 John chapter 5 that we can be confident when we come before God, confident that we can bring our request to him, confident that he hears us, but also confident that God is going to respond in accordance with his will and that ultimately this will turn out to be the best for us. And so in light of that, I wanna give you just a few implications for what this means for our own prayer life. Um, I imagine today that um, you come with something in your life or the life of a loved one or something in the world that you either have been praying about or perhaps if you're kind of new to this faith thing, or you're not quite sure what you believe about God, but you're curious and you're leaning in, um, you at least have a, a prayerful attitude about it and that it, it troubles you and you kind of want to talk and express it to God. Maybe you have prayed about it, even if you don't know for sure God's there, but some burden in your life or thing that you would like to see change that you've been in prayer about. And so I hope these implications of John's words and Abraham and Paul's story can maybe give you some guidance and give us guidance as we bring our requests to God. So let me just walk through these three implications. Number one, in prayer, it's good for us to ask for God's help without demanding. Now, we're demanding is important. What his help must look like. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And he said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he said, give us this day our daily bread. Now you've likely, if you spent much time in church, have heard a preacher say that if we're gonna pray for God's kingdom to come, we have to be willing at times to pray for our kingdom to, to go. We, if we want God's wants and God's will to happen, then we have to say, okay, God, I'm willing to maybe let go of things that, um, I preferred knowing that you have a perspective and you have wisdom and you have power that I don't and I need. So God, I pray that your will is done and then I also pray that you'll give me what I need today to trust that your way is the best. All right, it can be difficult to um, accept or trust God's will five years down the road or five months down the road or sometimes even five days. The answer is that God gives. But he says, give me today my daily bread. Right, what I need to um, survive, what I need to thrive, what I need to trust that your way is best. God, I want your way to happen on earth as it is in heaven, your will to be done. Give me what I need to see that through. And when, when we fail to, to keep 
God's will in view as we pray for our desires and we just demand what we want from him, we run the risk um, of what James warns us about in the book of James. James gives two um, errors that we can make when in prayer. He says, first, you do not have because you do not ask. And so there's sometimes that just like the the person I talked to a few weeks ago, um, they had been praying, but sometimes when someone goes, I believe God's in control, God knows the future, so why should I even bother praying to him? Like, what difference is it gonna make? James says here, you don't have because you don't, you don't engage with God at all. You don't pray, you don't ask, so you don't have. But then he also adds the second error, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Like, you have no thought about what God might want in this situation. Honestly, this prayer is just about what you and you want, and so um, it's less likely that God's gonna grant that as well. It may not be his will. And so we see here again, prayer being both petition and submission. I'm confident to ask of God's help, but I, I stop short of demanding what that help must look like. That's number one, the implication. Number two, we need to remember that prayer is no excuse for passivity. No excuse for us being passive. I'm always struck by the story of Moses and the Israelites as they prepared to cross the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 14, they're standing right there on the shoreline. It's this huge moment in the, the history of the Bible and of God's people, and there had to be a lot of nerves and excitement building up in that moment. And so Moses um, answered the people, and he said this in Exodus 14, 13, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. He's given his best leader speech. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You could probably take verse 14 there. You could probably plaster it on a t-shirt. Christians would gobble that stuff up, right? The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. It reminds me some of Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I'm God. He's God and we're not. So there's truth to this. This is encouraging, this is inspiring in the moment, like this is biblical, the Lord will fight for you, you just need to be still. And, and yet, I love what happens next in verse 15, the very next verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, after this big rousing speech, God says, why are you crying out to me? Basically, like, why, are you, why are you praying here in this moment? Tell the Israelites to move on. Like, your answer to your prayer is right in front of you. Goofball, like, I'm part in the Red Sea right now. Walk through the water. Like, there's your, there's your answer to prayer. So prayer is both, prayer requires both a stillness within our spirit to recognize he's God, we're not. But also, prayer requires a willingness to move. And we see this dynamic all throughout the Bible, not just in Exodus 14. We see it in the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and his friends um, have been in exile in Babylon. They come back to Jerusalem. They, they want to rebuild the city walls, one for the grandeur of the city, but also for the city's protection. And they start getting some opposition to their work around chapter four, including threats upon their life. And so this is what they do. Nehemiah 4 verse 9, it says, and we prayed to our God and we set a guard as a protection against them day and night. He says, hey, we prayed. We brought this need to God. What's, here's what's happening. Here's what we need from you, God. Would you answer our prayers? And they set protection out around the, the city's walls. They prayed and they moved. Well, what about King Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah? God tells Israel's king to put his affairs in order. Uh, Hezekiah has this, what the Bible calls a boil on his skin. It's become um, very infected. And so God says, Hezekiah, you're going to die. He lets Hezekiah know that that's coming through the prophet Isaiah. You're going to die. So, so put your house in order. Get everything ready that you want to get ready because it's coming. And the Bible says Hezekiah, he turns to the wall and he, he prays and he says, God, you know that I have, been, I have been faithful to you and others would not. I have done my best to walk the straight and narrow, to listen to you, to, to lead as a king in a way that would honor you, God, I, I'm asking for more time so I can do more good for you. And God hears Hezekiah's reasoning and he says, says, okay, I'll give you what you ask. And yet this is how the story plays out. Verse five of Isaiah 38, go and say to Hezekiah, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. So God answers the prayer that Hezekiah had prayed 15 more years. But then a few verses later, also, Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. So, so God had answered Hezekiah's prayer and then also told Isaiah to, hey, have them, have them treat the infection. Like God, they prayed, and they also gave Hezekiah medicine, basically. So here's some implications for our life about how prayer doesn't encourage passivity. If, if you're looking for a, a new job, career change, I, I bet that's one of the top five prayer requests I get after a service. Someone who just comes, they're frustrated at work, they say work's a bad environment, um, for them personally, they don't feel fulfilled in it, whatever the story, but, but that's a common prayer request I get. If, if you're looking for a new job or new work or a job, that's a wonderful thing to bring before the Lord. Like You, you should be in prayer uh, about that. And as you pray, you should also be brushing up your resume. And you should be, you should be networking with people that you know. You should perhaps be looking at the skill set you have thinking about the career that you want and saying, is there a gap here? Could I be gaining some skills or taking some class or training now that will prepare me for what I want to do? So like, so you pray that God would bring the right thing your way, but you also move and act to prepare yourself for that moment when God um, answers that prayer. If you're looking for someone um, significant in your life to spend your life with, you know, you're tired of being single, and I want to say that there's nothing wrong with being single. Singleness is a blessing, um, just as being in a relationship is a blessing. There is, there's good that comes out of both those scenarios. But you're, but you're tired of being single. You want to be with somebody else. Well, that's a wonderful thing to bring before God in prayer. And to pray that God would provide the right person, that your gifts and your personalities would complement each other, and it would be good not just for you, but for others and for the kingdom, and God would use you in great ways. Like, pray about all of those things. But it's also okay to go out and socialize a little, a little bit and meet some people, not just you know, play video games in the basement all day or not shower for a week or um, you know, whatever else may be going on. Like you can comb your hair and you can go out and like you ask someone out on a date possibly. It doesn't have to be a lot of pressure, but like you can, you can meet people and socialize and go out and you can start working on yourself so that when God brings the right person, like you're ready to, to be in a relationship with this other person because you've put in the work to round off some of those rough edges that may be there. Like you can pray and you can move. There may be someone in your life right now that you care about deeply who's not in a very good place. And you've been praying that God, would you help them turn their life around? Would you help make things better because it's been a really hard season for them? It's wonderful to pray about those things. We should always talk to God about people an uh, old professor of mine used to say, before we talk to people about God. So it's talk to God about that person and what's going on in their life and pray about that. But then also, as much as that person will let you, invest in their life spiritually. Ask them out for coffee. Invite them to your house. You know, Pray that God would bring a change in their life and then help as best as you can and as an appropriate level to invest in them and make a change as well. Like at some point, the knowledge of who God is and what God wants to see happen in the world should compel us to move even as we pray. And so we bring all of these things before God, but we remember prayer doesn't encourage us to be passive. And then finally, the last implication, in prayer, we should ask God for things that fulfill both our desires, like it's good to bring our desires before God, but also his wisdom and will. And this is what John, again, had told us in our passage. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Now, in our household, the Kenworthy house, um, Mondays are man day. We call Monday, man day Monday. And we instituted it just this year. Man Day Monday means that on Monday morning, after we wake up and get dressed, Daddy takes Ezra, our three-year-old son, um, out for breakfast. And then we go do something fun for an hour, hour and a half. Um, give, give Sarah, the goal one is to spend time with my son and also to give Sarah at least one day of the week where um, that initial part of the morning, like she can just, you know, take a deep breath and, 
and ease into that day a bit. So I'll take him out to breakfast, we'll play for a little bit, and then um, I'll bring him back home and I'll head into the office on Monday. Monday, Monday, a few weeks ago, Ezra told me, he said, Daddy, Monday is the best day of the week. It's like, talk to me again when you're 14. Tell me how, <laughs> tell me if you still wanna go out for Monday, Monday then, because my, my hope is that you know, we would keep breakfast once a week the whole time that he's under you know, our roof, but, but on, on man day Mondays, he, he can make several different requests, several things my son asks of me. Sometimes, sometimes he phrases them as questions, sometimes they're statements, but you know they're questions. He raises his finger when he wants to make a point. So he'll say, I, I, I sure do like Dunkin' Donuts, which means like, can we, can we go to Dunkin' Donuts for man day today? He'll say, e Ezra wants a sprinkle pancake at IHOP. Ezra, Ezra, wants, Ezra wants, can we go to IHOP? Uh, let's climb on the red balls at Target. You know, we want to go climb on the red balls. This past Monday, he wanted to go to Dunkin' Donuts, and we were sitting there at the inside. There's those big windows um, facing Frederick Street, and he looked out the windows, and he said, uh, he said, the college. Recognized it was, it was Kentucky Wesleyan College across the street. And he goes, uh, can we go touch the, the Black Panthers? He wanted to go touch the Panthers. And it was, even though it was spitting rain, a little bit, I said, yeah, we can go touch the, we can go touch the Panthers. We walked across, the, or drove across the street, touched the Panthers, and then he had noticed that there were, maybe you saw them too, some pinwheels um, on lining Frederick Street and then kind of down the main drag of the college, pinwheels that were set out, so he wanted to go check out all the pinwheels. And uh, several of them had blown over in the wind, and so we decided that we needed to set up, he decided he needed to set up all the pinwheels that had blown over and put them back on their stake. And so we spent you know, the next 30 minutes in the rain uh, you know, right there on that drag and on Frederick Street, putting those pinwheels back up and spinning them around. I saw that the Ruarks were here on, on Saturday night. They work at the college, so I said, I'll, I'll be expecting a thank you letter coming soon from the college that uh, you know, we put in the, this work for them. But mo most of Ezra's requests, like, like playing with the pinwheels or going to Dunkin' Donuts, they're within my power to grant. Almost everything that he asks for, I could give him if I desire. And sometimes, depending on the request, I, I give him what he asks for right away. You want to go get donuts? Sure, we can get donuts. We don't do that every day, but hey, Monday, man, Monday, Monday, it's a treat. Like, we'll go wherever you want to go. Sometimes I may delay his request until a better time. So we finish breakfast. If he says, Daddy, can we go to the, can we go to the park? And sometimes I may have to say, Buddy, I would love to go to the park with you today. It, it we'll go to the park again sometime in the near future, but right now... It's April, and it's snowing. Um, and when no one understands why, it's sleeting and snowing in April. But by golly, that's what's happening, buddy. So, you know, we'll go in two weeks, hopefully. But, uh, but we can't go today, so I may delay. Sometimes I might decline his request because it's just not good for him. If we go to Target, and he says, uh, Ezra, get some M&Ms. And I said, buddy, you just had, just had two donuts at Dunkin' Donuts. Like, you don't need M&Ms right now. It's too much sugar. So I may say, no, you can't have that. Or sometimes I may even set up a condition for his request. You know, if it gets warmer, he'll probably say, can we go swimming or can we go to the splash pad? And I might say, well, first we have to go home and, you know, get your swim trunks. Or we have to get your floaties. Or we have to run an errand for mommy and then we can go do that thing. So I say yes, but we set up a condition for for his question, and God works in much the same way with us. God may decline to give you something because he knows it's not in your best interest. And so God just says, no. Like, I, I hear your request, but, but no. God may delay in giving you something because he knows that many of your requests, just like my son's request, just like my request at times, like, they're, they're whimsical. Like, meaning today you're asking God for this, but tomorrow you're gonna ask for something incredible, entirely different. And so God's going to delay an affirmative response until, until we get closer to the heart of what you truly need. So he may delay in giving um, the response that you're looking for. God may withhold something from us until we ask for it in the appropriate spirit. Sometimes Ezra asks a question politely, like, Daddy, can we please? Sometimes he screams it at my face if we can do something. And I, I will tell you, probably the same way in your household, uh, he tends to get a better answer if he's not screaming it in my face. And when he asks it more, Politely, and there may be ways with God too. We can, we can yell and scream at God. We can bring our hurts to him in honest ways. We've talked about that a lot this past year. But there are times that we ask for something in a spirit that um, 
is not aligned with the heart of God. And God may say, you know what? That's a good request that you ask, but I'm, I'm gonna wait until you're at a point that you can receive it the way that I would intend to, to give it. And sometimes God would just say, yes. I would, I would love to give you that. Yes, I answer that prayer. And in all of these scenarios, we can have confidence, John says. Confidence that we can come to God with these requests. Confidence that he hears us. Confidence that he'll answer in accordance with his will, will and that this will turn out to be the best for us. Again, I love how Tim Keller puts it when he says, God will either give us what we ask for or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything that he knew. I've shared that quote before, but I think it's a good one. God will either give us what we ask for or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that we knew. So we, we have to trust that God's a good father who wants to bless his children. Jesus said it this way on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, which of you, if his son or daughter asked for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake? Well, if you then, though you are evil, meaning we have sin in our life, if you then, though you are evil, will give good gifts to your children, Monday, Monday, whatever it is, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So we bring our request to God. We trust that in his wisdom, even if he doesn't always respond in the manner that we want, that God responds with our best interest, petition and submission. And then as I bring this um, to a close, just kind of putting a period at the end of these ideas, I want to share with you three quick thoughts from a theologian named J.I. Packer who talks about prayer and how we bring our prayers to God. These will be really brief, but they fit with what we've said. I think they're a helpful way of saying some of the same truth. And I shared these a few years ago, but um, they're so good, I want to just touch on them briefly and then we'll close. J.I. Packer says, when praying, number one, lay before God the reasons you think what you're asking for is the best thing. If you were making a, a business plan proposal to an investor, or you were turning in a grant request, um, hoping to get some grant money, like you would have a presentation saying why you think what, what you're asking for is good and why it's gonna benefit the community and be a blessing. And when we come to God in prayer, it should be, at times, if we're asking for something serious, it's important to us, somewhat similar. We're laying out to God, God, here's why I'm asking for what I'm asking. Here's why I think this is a good thing. Here's why I think it could bless other people, why it would bless me, why it'd be good for the kingdom. You lay out for God the reasons you think what you're asking for is the best thing. It shows God that we, we care about what we're talking about. We've thought through what we're praying for. But there's also a very personal reason doing this is helpful. Sometimes as we lay out the reasons for our request, we may discover that what we're praying for couldn't possibly be God's will. I, I found this in my life where I'm saying, God, I, I want this because, you know, because I think this and this. And as I start getting into it, I realize this is not God's kingdom come. This is Scott's kingdom come. This is not the best thing for the church or for my family. Like This is the best thing for Scott. And then you, you might even get the answer right then to your prayer as you engage with God. Like, I'm not asking this in quite the right way. And so laying out that request isn't just for God, it's for, it's for you. N number two, Packer says, when you make your request, reaffirm to God that you need his wisdom and his knowledge and that if he wills something different than the best you can think of, then that is what you want him to do. We've talked about that this morning, so I don't need to say anything more about that, but it's good to hear someone else say it. And then number three, he says, ask God and ask yourself, what might I need to do to implement an answer to my own prayers? We believe when we pray, there are some things that only God can do. But we also said prayer doesn't allow us to be passive. So if, if we make a prayer that God help this family going through a hardship you know, we may be praying about things that are like these big macro, big picture things that we, we don't have any control over. But there may be something in our prayers. God, would you provide for them? Would you encourage them that, that we can step in and we can play a small part, small role in? We can offer encouragement. We can buy a meal. We can watch someone's kids so they can go take care of this other thing going on. We can step in and we can play a, a part. I saw a wonderful example of that just this week where someone... Um, I was out this week, some for spring break, but came back to the office Friday and had an envelope in my box that just said, hey, we're praying about this thing and, uh, and also want to be a blessing as we're, as we're praying. It just those type of prayers um, honor God and they help others. And in all of this, as we pray, it's imperative that we remember the only reason we can come before God in prayer this way is that we have a Savior who went before God the Father on our behalf. Jesus 
went to the, the altar before the Father as our perfect sacrifice, like that, that Palm Sunday. He, he's riding into to town. Everybody's shouting, he saves, he saves the one who saves. Like, they don't have a full understanding in that moment of all that Jesus is gonna have to endure and all that he's gonna go through to bring salvation. Like, he took our sin and our shame so that you and I can stand before God now in grace and we can cry, Abba, Father. Daddy, like, we, we need something from you. Would, you. would you hear our prayer? Would you respond in accordance with your will? And that's why we can trust. If God has our eternity covered, like, if he has our eternal interest at heart, and we know this through Jesus, like, we can trust he has our immediate interest at heart as well. We can be confident to come to him, confident that he hears, and confident that he'll respond um, with his best. Amen? All right, let's, let's pray um, for that trust together as a church family and as individuals. Um, God, there were so many, so many different prayers uh, represented in this room, so many different needs. And Lord, at times, the sheer thought of prayer, uh, I imagine for others like me, can be overwhelming and we can, we can fail to, to pray uh, because it just... We don't know what difference it makes or we're so exhausted that we, we don't even bother. And then other times, Lord, we pray and um, we may be wondering if we're praying the right thing or the right way. And there's no magic way to pray, God, but there are, some, there are some really good principles, really good ways that will demonstrate that we trust in you and that we're confident that you hear us. And so, God, I pray for all the requests represented in this room, online, on television, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the confidence to come before you, the confidence that you hear, and the confidence, God, that your response will be in accordance with your will and the best, the best possible thing. As we pray, God, help us to, to be still, help us to move, help us to know that the way we can even come before you in this moment and other times is through the grace of Jesus, like he, the perfect sacrifice. And so we call before you, Abba, Father, would you hear and answer these requests? We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let, let, let's stand together this morning. And in our, our time of response, uh, I always, almost always give an invitation for prayer and invite you to come to the altar. And I tell you that I'll be down here praying. So if you come, you're not gonna be alone. Same thing is true this morning. I'll be down here praying. But perhaps, perhaps today there's something that's been on your heart you've been praying for for the world, for your family, for you, for this church community, and you want to come based upon today's message and bring it before God up front. Maybe there's something that you've has been troubling you, but you've not brought before God at all in prayer yet, and now you want to make that first move to bring it before God in the spirit we've talked about today, to be confident he hears. Um, let's use this time to respond. We're going to sing about, about how God pulls through with the victory that we need, that we can overcome and as we sing that, if, if, if you have something on your heart to bring before in prayer, let's do that down front, and we'll take the Lord's Supper together, and then we'll close. But would you respond as we sing? the back. 
The line of that song that says that you took what the enemy meant for evil and you turned for good comes from uh, the story of Joseph when Joseph tells his brothers that they've come searching for food relief in the midst of a famine, the book of Genesis, and he says, hey, what you did to me, selling me off uh, into slavery, he says, you intended for evil, God intended it for good, and here's how he's beginning to bring that good together, and we see several times throughout scripture, we can probably point to times in our own life, how God's taken something that could have been uh, uh, felt hard and was hard and was painful, but uh, maybe even meant for evil, but God can turn it around and he can bring good things uh, even out of those painful moments. And there is nothing more clear or more power, powerful as an example than the cross. Jesus, on that Good Friday, he gave his life. And even though what the enemy meant for evil and his opponents meant for evil, God turned it into the greatest good, forgiveness and life, um, wholeness in him. And so let's take the bread and the juice. Um, this holy week, let's remember Jesus' body and blood. We're, we're remembering this today because every Sunday we want to remind ourselves. We're also looking forward to the days ahead when we remember in a special way all that Jesus has accomplished for us. Let's take the bread and break and remember Jesus' body. Let's take the juice and drink and remember Jesus' blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. If you want to remain standing, we'll dismiss in just a moment. Um, if after the service, if I can pray for you or if Donnie or someone can pray for you in any, any way, we'll be down front. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, if, if that would serve you. If you're just new to OCC and you've got some questions, if you're online, you can tell them in the chat that you've got a question. They could, they'll do their best to answer. If you're here on campus, we'd love to meet you out at the Welcome Center right here by Entrance B. There'll be friendly people there who would love to just point you in the right direction with any question or just get to know you and you, uh, you and them a little bit more. So I hope you'll take a, 
uh, us up on that. And you can still sign up for Serve the Borough out in the Global Cafe, which is the Saturday after Easter, kind of some things that whole week. But then Saturday the 23rd, there's a lot of special ways. We're going to be out with other churches in our community serving, and I hope that you'll take part in that coming up. And as you go out there to sign up for Serve the Borough, you can grab um, any invitation cards you want for Easter. Take them and use them to invite somebody to join us, join you next weekend. We would love to, to have you do that. Um, let's end with a, a blessing, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss. God, thank you so much that we can come to you and you hear us. Uh, there is something special about gathering together, God, but we know that you hear us even when we leave this place. And so we pray, Lord, this week we would be uh, in tune with you in prayer, talking with you about the things on our heart, things going on, confident that you hear and confident, God, that whether you respond exactly as we asked, um, not at all as we ask or somewhere in the middle, Lord, it is for, um, for your good, for our good, and God, you're going to bring good even out of what seems to be evil. Lord, do that more and more in Ukraine, in the world, in our lives, in our community. All the requests, spoken and unspoken today, we pray and look before you in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend, uh, Easter, Easter weekend. God bless.